So we're going to move on to Kristen Judge. She's our next speaker, and thank she's you. the thank you, Dan. Um, and she's the founder and CEO of the Cybercrime Support Network, and she's going to be talking about supporting cybercrime victims. Thanks for having me, Catherine and uh, Madeline. This is very exciting. And to be on a panel with Dan Lorman, Perry Carpenter, just amazing Jeff. Uh, it's hard to follow Dan, I know, but I'll give it a try. All right, whenever you're ready, Catherine, I'll share my screen. Um, yes, you can share now. Okay, thank you. And I will do this and go to present. Slideshow, play from start. There we go. All right. All set? Uh, yes, take it away. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me. I have to say, I'm just so proud of uh, the work that Catherine and Madeline are doing. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be able to support uh, young people, especially young women, uh, getting involved in this career. I love to mentor people and uh, would love to help them in any way that I can. It's great to see others feel the same way. So thank you uh, for the opportunity. And it's so great to see some of my friends on here. Overview. So CSN, the Cybercrime Support Network is, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. No one else is home to take the dogs off my hands. So but they'll be taken care of in a minute. They're almost home. Uh, the Cybercrime Support Network is a nonprofit. We are 501c3 public-private partnership. I started the company back in 2017. We became a nonprofit, and um, we have grown. We started uh, with myself as the only person. I left my paying job January 2018, and we now have 31 people on our team. We are helping Americans to be able to report recover from a cyber incident, and then reinforce their security after they've been impacted by cybercrime. We have an incredibly esteemed uh, board of directors. You may know some of these people on here, public and private sector uh, leaders in this space who are technologists and non-technologists, so we're, we're very proud of our, our board of directors. Some of our partners that we work with, this is just a very small list of our partners. The rest are on our website, cybercrimesupport.org. But you can see that we work with uh, law enforcement, federal, state, and local, and victim services organizations, and then information sharing organizations. Those are really some of our three key stakeholders. We started CSN to address two problems. Number one, we know there's probably about 50 million Americans that are victims of cybercrime every year and most of them have no idea where to go to get help. And we're talking about small businesses and consumers. That's really our audience. And then we don't know how much cybercrime really is costing us because we haven't counted the victims. Uh, we do get some counts uh, to some agencies, but we know we're missing a lot of people. So until you can actually know the true cost of cybercrime, it's hard to get Congress to act and make the changes that are needed to help people combat uh, cybercrime. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Internet Crime Complaint Center. We really appreciate their partnership from the very beginning. We've been working with them for about five years now. And the reason I like to share this last statistic is in uh, 2019, they had 450,000 complaints come in. And of those 450,000 people, not even a little bit, just a little bit bigger than Washtenaw County where I live, they lost $3.5 billion. So if you think about what the true cost of cybercrime is, according to much research, it says that one out of four Americans is a victim every year, that'd be close to $338 billion in losses every year. This is an economic crisis on top of the current economic crisis and others that we've had, so it really needs to be addressed. We get asked a lot, uh, you know, what are the cybercrime definitions? What is cybercrime? So we've been pulled into this um, area also, we're working on an international level with the World Economic Forum, other think tanks, uh, New York State Cyber Task Force, and others on what do we call certain cyber crimes and can we have one taxonomy or one cyber crime category list that we all use internationally. You know, if someone takes um, down a report for a crime of murder, it's pretty much a standard definition no matter where you go in the world, most likely. But for cybercrime, it's not quite the case. So we've been working on this on an international basis. We've created a cybercrime compendium for law enforcement to use based on if they are 
uh, a law enforcement officer, you know, with a small agency versus someone who is working on the forensics and the investigation. And we're hoping that's going to be adopted uh, in the country of Canada soon and then hopefully other places around the world. So the reason we exist is to help people figure out this one question. Where do I start? I've been a victim of a romance scam, a small business compromise, um, an imposter scam where someone pretended they were the FBI and I sent them money. Who do I call first? And unfortunately, uh, right now, a lot of people call 911, regardless of what happened to them. 911 gets calls for things like this. It is actually a true tweet. I had another one that said, um, please don't call LA County Sheriff's Office if your Facebook isn't working. I'm sure for some people, when your Facebook and YouTube is down, it's an emergency, but we don't want people calling 911. And during times like IRS tax scam, some of the dispatch centers that we talked to said they can get up to 100 calls a day from cybercrime victims that they just have to turn away. So we said to the law enforcement, what can we do to help you? What do you need from us? And they said, we need a website that people can go to so they can find out where to go to get help. And I call this slide the hotline issue because there are a lot of great places to go to get help if you've been a victim of cybercrime or online fraud or identity theft or other victimizations. But if you're just you know, Googling, I've been a victim of this, it, you'll get 8 million pages of options of where to go. We need to make sure it's very simple for people, just like if they've been a victim of a violent crime, they go to 911 and they get the help they need. With cybercrime, it's not that straight of, a, of an arrow. So we're trying to get people to where they need to go the first time they call someone. So what we started doing a few years ago is using the existing 211 infrastructure. Many of you may not know about 211, but we're very thankful to partner with them in six or seven states now. And 211 currently exists and they cover 95% of Americans. If you call 211 where you live, except for a few rural areas around the country, you can get help with human services needs. That could be you need help with food, uh, shelter, prisoner reentry, mental health referrals, child care referrals. 211 is usually run by a United Way or a nonprofit or the county or city government. And they do an incredible job of helping millions of Americans find what they need every year. So, what we did is we partnered with them in certain states and we got federal funding to train the 211 call specialists, increase the number of call specialists answering the phone and then let the public know that they could call 211 if they needed help. So currently we just are launching in North Carolina and New Jersey statewide this week, today and yesterday. And we're live in Mississippi, West Michigan. We just expanded to 13 more counties. Orlando, Florida, we're expanding to another 10 to 12 counties. And we're statewide in Rhode Island. And October 1st, we'll find out if we get the funding to go statewide in Texas, California, and Florida. California, probably not October. Um, they've got a lot going on there right now with the fires, and we're very respectful of that. But hopefully, um, we will have one national number for people to call if they're a victim of cybercrime. But we wanted to make sure that this worked. And what we found is, even in many of the cities and states where we're live with the 211, people like to go to the website, fraudsupport.org, eight to one compared to wanting to call and talk to someone. And it does break down a lot by age too. So, so we wanna make sure we're serving people wherever they are. And when people do call 211, this was not surprising to anybody who works in um, cybercrime. Pretty much most of the people calling are about a financial purchase scam or an imposter scam. So about 50% of the people probably lost money either trying to buy something online, sell something online, or someone convinced them that they were supposed to give them money, like in a romance scam or a grandparent scam. So after talking to those dispatchers, you know, back, it was uh, in 2018. Uh, in 2018, November, we launched Fraud Support because 911 dispatchers said to us, if we could just have a website that we can send people to, then we can say we help them, but we didn't keep them on the line with 911 where um, they really shouldn't be to get help uh, for a cyber crime unless someone is in danger. So on Fraud Support, we've had over 600,000 people visit so far. And you can see here, when you go to Fraud Support, you can either click, I'm a business, or I'm an individual. And then we have some special pages that we're building out for military personnel and families, uh, adult, older adults and their caregivers, and then young children and teens. And we're very excited about the military page because we were just given a large gift by Craig Newmark, the founder of Craigslist, 
to build a national military campaign. So that is gonna be uh, much more robust uh, coming soon. If you're an individual and you click on, I'm an individual, I need help, you're gonna get five categories to choose from right now. Let's say you, you clicked a financial purchase scam. Then there are a lot of different kinds of financial purchase scams. So you'll be get, getting this screen next. Let's say you clicked on online shopping scams. Now you're done having to navigate through the site. And you're gonna start getting to some help now. And um, on the site, you'll see the definition of online shopping scam. So you'll know what, what is an online shopping scam. Then some, some immediate steps to take. Um, if you want to find out where do I go, who do I call, and then information on how to report, recover from the incident, and then reinforce your security. Recover doesn't always mean get your money back, but there may be other things that you need to do to put your house in order after you've been a victim of cybercrime. And we try and find great resources that have already been built, or we're building some resources of our own to really help with this after the incident. Um, that's really our our focus area is uh, after someone's been a victim, how do they get things put back together? And then we want to reinforce their security because I have a, a, a corny um, uh, saying I like to use, when there's been a breach, it's the best time to teach. And yes, Dan, you can steal it. You can even say you, can, you, made, up, you made it up. You don't have to give my name. But when there's been a breach, it's the best time to teach. So we want to make sure while people have been you know, impacted by a breach or a cybercrime, I think they're more likely to add two-factor authentication and to change their security posture. So we're trying to decrease re-victimization when someone comes to fraudsupport.org and gets help from us. So on fraud support, we also have these nine categories that a small business can go and take uh, in more information. And they will go through the same process, click on based on what happened to them, and then get some information on how to report, recover, and reinforce their security. And part of the issue right now is there are different places to go depending on what's happened to you. And so we're the first organization that really narrowed that down and showed people the path that they need to take. We're very proud of our relationship with Google. They've been working with us for years now as one of our uh, key sponsors and advisory board members. And they came to us about a year ago and said, or maybe six months ago, and said, you know, we really need to um, look at the issue of catching people before they follow through with a scam. So they're, in, they're embroiled in a potential scam, like they've fallen in love with someone they met on Facebook, and they're in the middle of a romance scam, which is the number one thing that people visit fraud support for right now. And it is draining the bank accounts of millions of people every year. And we really are focused on romance scams this coming year at CSN. Um, and so they said, can we come up with a website that's very simple to use, that is geared towards senior citizens? So we changed the font and the, the pictures on there to make sure that it was really focused on seniors without calling it out, because anybody can benefit from the site. But we really want to make it senior friendly. We're trying to make a lot of our things right now senior friendly. So on scamspotter.org, people can go there to get practical advice to figure out, am I being scammed right now? Is this for real? And so we came up with three golden rules with our partners at Google. Number one, slow it down. Anybody who works in this space knows that scammers that are sending you phishing emails, even scammers on the phone, there's usually an urgency. They're saying, oh, you have to hurry up and get me your password or hurry up and send me money. I've been in an accident, whatever it may be. So we're telling people just number one, slow it down. Take a minute then, number two, and spot check. If you just got an email that says it's from your bank, and they said, we need all your banking information. Your bank account's going to be locked. Okay, slow down for a minute. And now go find the phone number of your bank on the back of your bank card and call them and say, did you just send me this email? Most likely they didn't. And the third golden rule, if we could just stop people from sending gift cards and wiring money to people they don't know, but gift cards are really um, the venue of choice or uh, the avenue of choice right now for the criminals. A gift card is never a form of payment. And if we can make sure everyone knows that, then we think we can stop a lot of scams. What the scammers will do is ask people to send them the numbers on the back of a gift card, and then they'll use that to purchase things. And there's really no way to trace uh, where that money went and people don't get it back. I have heard that retailers are doing a better job when someone comes to their, uh, their checkout and they have $2,000 in gift cards and they made me look a little bit nervous, they could say, 
you know, do you know the person who you're sending these gift cards to? Do you know about a scam that's happening? Uh, without trying to get too involved in their personal life, they can say, there are things called gift card scams. Just thought you'd want to know about that before you purchase $2,000 in gift cards. So please check out Scam Spotter and Fraud Support and please share with your friends. We're finding um, all kinds of attention. I think we're getting at least 60 or 70,000 people a month on Scam Spotter. And they're following through and taking the quiz and trying to figure out, am I in the middle of a romance scam? Am I in the middle of a COVID scam? And it's really been uh, a fantastic site for us. So what does success look like for CSN? For us, we want to increase reporting. Uh, we know that until we count the victims, it's gonna be hard for Congress to be able to put together what is needed out in the field. We know we need not just more training for law enforcement, but we need law enforcement officers who are cyber specialists. Um, you know, it, you just can't say to the existing law enforcement infrastructure, now you have to take on something else. Here's a little bit of a two hour training and now become cyber forensics experts. What we need is specialized um, agencies, specialized staffing that come into fusion centers, FBI local field offices, and state police, and help with cyber crime. So if we increase the reporting, hopefully our friends in the House and Senate will see the need there and then increase the staffing funding for these great agencies that we work with. We want to increase people's ability to recover. When we did research with the public uh, in Michigan, one out of four people said, I don't even try and fix it. I know I lost the money and I just don't tell anybody and I don't do anything about it. Two out of three people said, uh, or excuse me, um, about 50% of the people say, I try and get help. I called all over. I called this place and this place and this place. I reported here, I reported there and no one ever got back to me. So there's a lot of frustration. So we wanna make sure people have a way to recover from these incidents. And the people that call 911, or excuse me, that call our, our program where we have 211 Live, 90% of them say, I think I'm not gonna be a victim again because now I know where to call to get help. And I've talked to somebody about this. I feel smarter about it. And they also say they're very satisfied with the help that they got. 10% say they're not satisfied because we didn't help them get their money back. But as you all know, we're not gonna get the money back if the perpetrators are in a country that we don't have an agreement with. And once it's gone uh, through the wire, if it's a smaller amount, no one's gonna go chase it back. But we are helping people recover with the other aspects of the crime and they're 90% satisfied with what we're doing for them. So that's a really big deal for us. At the end of the day, we're here to serve the victims. And then we wanna have increased resources. We have a cooperative agreement now with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, CISA agency. It's been renewed for a second year. We are building out a resource catalog that will be on fraud support. We have about 1,200 resources that will be searchable there. We did a gap analysis to see what kind of resources are available to people before, during, and after a cyber crime. And then we're trying to fill in some of the holes. As you might guess, there's not a lot of resources for small businesses. So that's one of the places we're really focusing on right now. And on fraud support currently, we have a resource page. So there's some great infographics and things there that you can share and log, or excuse me, um, uh, download and share anytime. But pretty soon that's gonna be a searchable database of over 1200 resources. So I hope you'll come back and check out fraud support often. We just added uh, three more categories of threats on there. We did something about um, webinar hosting as that came up. Fraud support's always evolving with the threats. And at the end of the day, we're going to decrease crime because we're going to decrease re-victimization. We know on the dark web now that there are lists that you can buy, and they're basically people that have been scammed um, and, and lost money and given money away to criminals. And so the criminals will sell their name as a hot prospect. So it's really important that we decrease re-victimization and get to people after their first victimization to stop this chain of over and over, and then eventually they give away all of their money. We would not be here without our public-private partners. Um, we truly appreciate uh, them supporting us. Uh, we also are getting funding through the Department of Justice for our victims' work in the states. And like I said, our Department of uh, Homeland Security CISA Cooperative Agreement um, will be extending until we have a national program. I'm hoping in about two years we'll have a national number to call. It'll be a nationally funded program and uh, people will be getting the help that they need, similar to what they have in countries like Israel, uh, Australia, the UK, uh, Singapore, 
and Canada. And we're working with all of those uh, countries to make sure that we know best practices. So thank you so much for, uh, oh, sorry about that. It doesn't have my title and name. Uh, I, I'm Kristen Judge. I'm the founder of uh, Cybercrime Support Network. And you can reach me on LinkedIn, or you can also reach me at info at cybercrimesupport.org. We'd love for you to go to our YouTube channel. We have a lot of great one minute videos there. I also do uh, Cyber Tip Tuesdays live on LinkedIn at 3 p.m. 305 Eastern. And this week we're starting our very first Cyber Threat Thursday and Eric Crone from Nova 4 will be uh, my first guest. So I'm open to any questions. Hi, Kristen. Um, okay, so we have a question from the audience that we collected before the speech and it's, um, has Cybercrime Support Network seen a difference in reports before, during and after the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yes, actually, uh, the COVID-19 scams uh, are going up exponentially. Our partners at the IC3 said that they used to get about 1,000 reports a day. They're getting about 4,000 a day, and most of those are around COVID-19 scams. So COVID-19 scams, we have a special blog um, that's linked to our page, and we talk about literally probably 40 or 50 different types of scams. So yes, it's gone up. And so another question that we got from one of our audience members today is, have you seen any specific age groups targeted for cybercrime? So elderly, millennials, et cetera, or is it just across the board? It is an, oper uh, an equal opportunity issue, but I'll stop there. The ones that have to do with a lot of money loss, if you think about it, my 23 year old son doesn't have any money. He's still in college. We still support him. Why would someone go after him with a large phishing idea to steal money from him? They wouldn't. And so I like to make sure people know that senior citizens aren't vulnerable because they don't understand computers. They're the biggest target because they have the most money. So we have to be there to support our seniors, educate them on what they need to do. But when we look at who comes to fraud support for help with cyberbullying, with uh, romance scams, uh, hacked devices, it is all over the board. And the FBI IC3 and the FTC Consumer Sentinel, they break down their complaints by age. And it is, we are all susceptible. No one should be embarrassed if they're a victim of cybercrime because it can happen to absolutely any one of us. And it doesn't matter how old you are, how good you are at computers, uh, and what position you hold. So no, there is no one group that is uh, more uh, targeted, but there are some groups that are more impacted. Um, we have a, another question from the audience kind of related to what you said, um, saying that there's a lot of cybercrime victims who are embarrassed about coming forward. So how do you support them specially? Yeah, so what we want to start doing is having people tell their stories. And I have a few minutes, so I'm going to just share. There are things called obituary scams. And I used to teach about them all the time, but I didn't know anybody who had, had been impacted by it. And my mother-in-law, we lost my father-in-law in April. And I tried to get her to not put all of the kids' names, all the grandkids' names on the obituary. But that's the old-fashioned way to do it. And so she did. But obituaries don't just go in the Sunday paper anymore on your front porch. They're global. So within a week of the obituary going out, she got a call from someone named Connor, my son's name, saying he was in Pennsylvania, where Frank was born. And he had been there for someone's funeral from COVID-19, but he was in an accident and he needed money right away. She didn't think, oh, wait, Kristen taught me about this. She thought, my friend Nancy, this actually happened to her. And I remember her telling me about it. And so she hung up on him. So she heard from a friend. It's really important. This can happen to anyone. Encourage people to tell their story. Tell it loud. Tell it online. And get the word out there. Because the sooner we let people know it's not just you, the sooner we can really help the entire ecosystem. Great. And so another question we had was, how can companies help with your support network? It seems like a good way to give back and to help our own employees. Yeah, it is. And so, you know, you can put posters up in your uh, organization so people will use fraud support. We have rack cards you can get. So if you go to info at cybercrimesupport.org, we can send you information that you can use in your organizations. Put fraud support on your website. You can have a donation campaign. Uh, some companies are, are doing a, a, um, an employee donation campaign or birthday campaigns on Facebook. Um, and then we have our company sponsors. So if people are interested in doing that, they can get a hold of me and, and we'll talk about that. But there's lots of ways to get involved. You can do a Twitter chat with us, a webinar, um, build collateral together. We really love to work with our partners. 
that's a, those are all great ways that I think companies can help. But we had another question for how can the individual people in the audience help spread awareness? Yeah. So, you know, if you go to any of our uh, social media and just start retweeting things, um, follow me on LinkedIn and share with your friends, we're getting a lot of growth on our social media because people are sharing our pages. And the more people that share that have an issue or have a concern about this issue, the more we're going to get the word out. So we'd love to have people follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and uh, just let people know through those, those means. We're on Facebook, Twitter, uh, and LinkedIn. And so if you can share our information, that would be great. If you want to you know, take rack cards to your church or your school, uh, let us know. We'll send them to you. And you can just share it that way. Put up posters in your local libraries. Um, take posters to your 911 dispatch centers if you work with state and local law enforcement. Lots of ways to get the word out. Great. And so, yeah, another question from our audience. Um, so related to embarrassed for individuals, how do you maybe encourage organizations to come forward that may be worried about liability? Yeah, so there are liability laws that protect organizations, and this is more in Dan's purview, so I would love to, you know, have him answer more, but the Information Sharing Act of 2015, I believe, made it so that if a business uh, reports to, I believe it was um, an information sharing and analysis organization or an IC, SAC, like the MSI SAC, the Retail ISAC, or the Department of Homeland Security, they have some protections from liability. So, you know, our partners in federal government are not there to punish the companies that come forward if they've had a breach. They're there to help them at the Department of Homeland Security They want an FBI. They want to help them fix it. So if they can reach out to the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI local field offices, they can get some help. Um, we have another question here about how do you see the Cybercrime Support Network growing in the future beyond just um, the next few months like you talked about? Yeah, uh, we are planning on building the national program for victims of cybercrime like they have in uh, Israel. It's 119 for cybercrime. So we are on track to work with our partners in the federal government to be funded in the next two years to build, to build a national center. So all Americans, small businesses, and consumers will have one number to call one website to go to to get the help that they can from any of the agencies that are available to help them. And then I believe we only have time for one more question, um, but another one from the chat was, you mentioned Congress. Are there any champions of this work taking the lead in Congress? There are. There are so many great champions. So Congressman Jim Langevin started the Congressional Cyber Caucus 20 years ago before cyber was even a thing. And he's out of Rhode Island. That's how our program got started in Rhode Island first. And so he's been an incredible champion for us. And then we're working with the Homeland Security Committee on the House and the Senate side. We have many champions there. Um, and people on even the uh, financial services team uh, on the House side, that committee is interested in our work. So Department of Justice, obviously the Judiciary Committees, we're doing a lot of outreach, letting them know that we're already funded by federal government. We're already building a federally funded program, but every office we call says, why don't we have this already? You know, why is there no national number like these other five countries? And I said, you know, we're working on it. We're making enough noise to make sure the funding comes in and we're, we're ready to support them. Gotcha. Well, again, thank you so much for uh, taking some time every day to come speak to all of our uh, audience members here. And so I would like to introduce our next panelist, but again, thank you thank again. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Thank you.